Okay, uh, thank you for joining us, Mike. And uh, Andrea, thank you for uh, coming in to, um, to tell us a little bit more about uh, diplomas uh, for, for all types of students and the types of things that they run into. Um, yep. Andrea is, uh, actually, what is your official uh, position title? I feel it, like you've got the several. The official title is Worker Skills Manager. Workplace <laughs> Skills Manager. Okay, work so. Force. Workforce. Force. No, workplace. No, I don't even remember my title. Workplace skill. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they went back and forth with a lot of different titles i'm like i still want a career development manager but, <laughs> yeah. but i mean you help uh you help all kinds of students with uh any like uh any goals they have for achieving jobs or college or training like anything within that sort of career track mm -hmm. idea you you do lots of one-on-one -on -one, um meetings with people so you've You've had a lot of experience in in relation to uh, tonight's uh, uh, subject. So yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks mm -hmm. for inviting me. So should I just start now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay uh, do I have sharing uh, screen sharing capability or uh, try? Yeah, go ahead. No, I it's disabled. Uh, Any co-host or? Okay, uh, so all participants can share now. Okay, great, thanks. Yay, okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to put this in presentation mode, if it will let me. Okay, so um, as Vince said, my name is Andrea horton Richley. I am the Workforce Skills Manager here at the University of Pittsburgh. There's my title. <laughs> um, and, um, I help all of our students with their career and or post-secondary goals. Um, a lot of which um, with our uh, immigrant uh, students um, require um, looking at their previous education from their countries and um, talking to them about um, uh, the validity of their education when it's in the, uh, when it comes to the United States, uh, workforce employment and or um, post-secondary um, uh, goals. So today we're gonna to be talking about just that, the diplomas from GED to verifying foreign documents. Today, um, at the end of this presentation, you will learn about the two different GED testing options and the requirements, learn about the process of evaluating foreign education, have a better idea of when, why, when or why an immigrant needs to obtain a high school equivalency diploma, learn about the common steps needed to get reciprocity, a professional certification, a foreign uh, professional certification in um, Pennsylvania. And learn why some immigrant professionals professionals decide to start over from the beginning. Uh, and that is always gutting to me when that happens. Mm -hmm. Real quick, the um, most of these apply to, or some of these it looks like apply to American born students as well as uh, immigrant students, right? Um, most of these are immigrant students, but the GED side, the different testing options are, uh, pertain to all students, regardless of where they were uh, born. Um, so the first, uh, basically just the first, um, objective gotcha. is for all students, for, us, for our, um, immigrant population. But if there's any questions about, uh, um, native born students um, that um, Mike has or that you Vince uh, have uh, been asked for and would like to ask um, on behalf of tutors who have asked you, feel free to ask, okay? Okay, so the GED exam. So as you know, um, COVID had um, hit us hard <laughs> and um, it kind of like shut everything down. And so students who were um, preparing to take their GED exams or in the middle of taking their GED exams. They had already scheduled some exams. They were just canceled uh, because all the testing centers shut down. And um, it took quite a while, uh, quite a few months actually for uh, GED test services to uh, get the remote GED exam up and running with their protocols and procedures um, that need to be followed. So there are two testing options now um, and I do hope that they continue the remote option as well once things get back to the new normal. Um, so you, they can test remotely at home and they can take uh, their GEDs at a testing center. There are open testing centers on but they are open on a limited basis and they do follow um, 
social distancing guidelines. So um, even though they're open, they may be open at half capacity that um, uh, as compared to what they could seat at one time before COVID hit. So testing remotely, this option has a lot of strict requirements, rules and protocols that need to be followed. Um, and uh, well, let me just go. So we can uh, look at this um, right now. I do have this open. So let me see if I can share my internet here. So taking the um, remote GED test online um, requires a few steps. So everybody in their GED.com account has an alert um, on their account that uh, will prevent them from uh, scheduling a remote exam. So to lift that alert, they need to um, follow these steps right here. So first they need to run a system test uh, on their computer internet uh, to make sure that it's compatible with the OnView software that needs to be downloaded uh, from um, GED testing services, which will allow the proctor to um, watch them and listen to them while they're taking their exam. And it is gonna be, the exams are recorded um, in case there's any, um, um, anything that might happen if, uh, if they stop the exam, if the tester stops the exam, the student can argue and, and, and you know, fight for it and they review the, um, the recording. Um, they also need to email their uh, Pennsylvania ID or government issue ID um, along with proof of PA, res PA residency to the state um, to validate their PA residency. Then and only then they will the, the alert will be lifted uh, so they can schedule their um, remote GED exam. Um, and also to be to qualify to even schedule the remote GED exam, they have to have passed the uh, practice test in that particular subject within the previous 60 days. So say they, they pass their practice test in uh, math today, their GED ready exam. They have 60 days until today, from today, to take and get to schedule and take their um, remote GED exam in math. Um, if it's more than 60 days, they'll have and they want to take it remotely, they will have to uh, retake the practice test and pass it um, to um, be able to schedule and examine that subject. Um, and that is only for the remote exams. Um, it is uh, not for the uh, scheduling at a testing center. The testing center does not have that um, 60 day. Uh, limit on uh, scheduling the exams after practicing, after uh, uh, passing the practice test. Um, also the, to schedule a test at a testing center, you don't even have to take, you don't even have to um, take a practice test to even schedule at a testing center. You can just schedule them and, and go if you want, but in order to qualify for a scholarship from us, you do need to uh, take and pass the practice exams. Related so, to um, that scholarship, I, I know yeah. we give the, the GED readies one at a time, would we also then sort of do a rolling thing of like, we know your 60 days is coming up, um, take the math online while you're maybe still doing the, the yeah, science. I encourage our students to do that. It's like, um, you know, if you pass one of the practice exams, um, get the real exam out of the way, knock it out of the, you know, get knock it off your list, uh, okay. your to-do list. And, and that will allow you to concentrate on the other subjects. You don't have, a student does not have to, all the practice tests before they ask for a scholarship voucher or before they even schedule their real exam, you know, if they don't want a scholarship voucher. They can just um, pass it, pass the practice test and take it the next day if they want, if it's, uh, if it's available. Um, that day and time is available to take it. Um, but uh, um, to get a, a, to qualify for a scholarship from us, they do need to not only pass it, uh, but they need to pass with a 149 higher passing for all the subjects is 145 but to qualify for a scholarship they need a 149 or higher that is about a two question buffer uh, because 145 146 that's still in that gray area um, and because nerves do hit students when they take their exam and um, they, they, they uh, some of them get anxiety that could um, cause them so we want them just to be a little bit higher um, so I'm not going to play this um, for you, but it does give a great, um, uh, it gives some really good information about uh, the requirements for the exam, the steps needed uh, to, you need to follow to um, before you can take an exam and um, 
what you do need to do when you're um, on the test day, uh, because um, uh, it is very strict, let me just say that. I mean, you do not want to give the proctor any reason to terminate your exam. So all these things here are prohibited. So um, they have to be in a room um, that's quiet and, and has a closed door. They take their in a, a kitchen, they can take it in a living room, a dining room, it needs to be in like a bedroom with a closed door. There cannot be anybody in the room with them. Um, and I think I'm with them either, like no books, no nothing, at least not within um, arm's reach. Um, so the only thing they can have. How can they possibly verify that? How can they verify that? Oh, I, I'll tell you in just a second. <laughs> uh, um, so um, the only thing they can have with them is a plugged in laptop and a clear glass of water. They can't have any pencil or paper. Uh, so when um, they can't even use headphones or anything, nothing. Um, so the day of the exam, so say their exam time is uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. They are required to check in 30 minutes prior to their test time. So they need to check in at 10.30 a.m. and they'll check in uh, by logging into their account, clicking the launch button and following the check-in procedures. Um, and that includes taking um, their smartphone, so they have to have a smartphone, um, and um, taking pictures of their testing room, taking a selfie, taking a picture of their ID again, and sending it, you know, the instructions and sending it where it needs to go. And then they, their exam time comes and uh, the proctor gets on. Sometimes they have to wait a little bit. Um, when the proctor gets on, the proctor will want them to um, uh, use their webcam and lift up their laptop, show them everything in the room, like a 360 um, and their desk area and stuff like that, um, using the um, to, so they can see that there's nothing there except maybe a clear glass of water. Why not a bottle of water? I don't know because <laughs> computers are like they can knock over. I'm like, <laughs> um, but it's a clear glass of water if they want anything. So, and um, a student told me today that they're not even allowed to um, move. They can't go like this or anything like that. They have to stay still and be um, th um, in the middle of the camera, and they can't even move their mouth. That they can't like go like cheating is strictly prohibited. Or, I mean, who are you talking to? You know, um, the, you don't want to give the proctor any reason to terminate the exam. Even if um, they hear a voice, if it's, it doesn't matter if it's not in the room. Um, so if a student lives in a loud area or they have family, a loud family, um, uh, they may not be very good candidates to take the exam at home uh, because um, if the proctor hears voices, they could terminate the exam. Um, it's, it, it can be very strict. And uh, so, um, or if they have children or babies or anything like that, um, they can't, you know, it, it's best to that they take it at a testing center. Um, plus at a testing center, you have the tools, you, you'll get the whiteboard, uh, like the scratch paper and pencil, but they use whiteboard and dry erase marker just to say trees. Um, and they get the handheld calculator. Where the remote exam, you can't have anything. You have to use all, all the online tools. So on this web page, which is in the, um, the PowerPoint uh, that um, I will email to Vince to share with, um, to attach to the, um, uh, along with the recording, um, they have tutorials for the online calculator, which is in uh, both the math GED ready and the science GED ready for questions that need um, a calculator. And the on scratch, uh, say on screen scratch pad and on screen whiteboard um, so they can practice. Unfortunately, uh, GED testing services has not included the whiteboard and the uh, scratch pad in the practice tests. I don't know why, um, but I um, encourage students who um, want, who know they want to take their, their exams remotely to, um, uh, to use the online calculator. Do not use a, a handheld during the practice tests. Um, you know, try to mimic the remote testing environment as much as possible when they're taking their practice tests. Um, and so if, um, I mean, of course, you know, they can have their scratch paper in the practice test, but in the real test, they can't have it. Um, they'll have to use this. And it's, this is really hard uh, to do. I've tried working the whiteboard and I'm very, I guess, OCD to a certain extent to where 
if my numbers are not looking right, I get frustrated. It's like, ah, you know, I keep racing to leave it. So if your student is like that, they might be best to take it at a testing center uh, so they can actually write it with their hand on a, a dry erase board. Um, Cause it, it is difficult, it's, but they do. Uh, that's why they have these uh, tutorials. Um, so yes, so that is the remote GED exam. Um, let me stop sharing my PowerPoint again. Um, so um, the other option, of course, is the, um, the testing centers. The testing centers that are currently open are Goodwill and Lawrenceville on a limited basis. They have maybe one test day every week or two. Um, so most of the time their calendar is empty in the GED.com uh, calendar to, uh, when you're scheduling the exam. The, one that, the ones that are always um, open uh, or at least on the same days of the week are Penn State, uh, Greater Allegheny and, and McKee Sport. It's not on the Penn State campus. It's in uh, an old YWCA building on um, 9th Street. It's their testing center for Penn State. Um, they uh, test every Friday and sometimes on Saturdays too. Penn Commercial Business Technical School in Washington, PA. Oops, I didn't realize that this was blocking it. Uh, in Washington, PA tests every Friday morning. Um, there is no bus that goes out there on Friday. So students will need a car to go to the last two. There are buses to the first two. Um, the last two are not in Allegheny Car. Um, Penn Commercial Business Technical School is in Washington County and Armstrong Center for Community Learning in Contanning is in Armstrong County. But this last one had tests every day, Monday through Friday. Um, it has many test times during the day. It's pretty much all, um, all, all open office hour times. Um, and, uh, but you do need a car to get there. And it is about 45 minutes to an hour drive from the South Hills um, in Good, good traffic, <laughs> um, but they do have uh, both of them are free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and eating up four twenty eight. So. Yeah, yeah. Oops. Yeah, depending on what time the test is, you. I mean, I always uh, tell the students, you know, um, you want to leave um, at least 20, 30 minutes earlier than usual, just in case you hit traffic, construction, an accident, uh, because if you if a student um, doesn't get there in time for their exam, they, they lose the money, the voucher. And um, technically it's not supposed to count as a, an exam attempt, uh, but on one of the students recently when she missed her exam uh, because of traffic, <laughs> um, it counted. And I was like, what is going on, you know? Um, but she was fine, she didn't wanna dispute it. So um, if that does happen, you can dispute it with um, GD testing services. Um, but um, on here, uh, CCBC is also open as well. Um, I didn't put that on here because it's uh, in another county also. And it, it just recently opened about a month ago, maybe. Um, but um, they, they test on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So they are an option as well, CCBC. But again, you need a vehicle. So uh, uh, just to confirm, because there was a little bit of audio glitching happening. Oh. Um, so for the first two, Goodwill in Lawrenceville and Penn State in McKeesport, public transportation can get you there. For mm -hmm. Penn Commercial uh, and Technical School um, and Armstrong Center, um, you need a you need car to get to those. Mm -hmm. okay. And CCBC, which is not on this list, which uh, opened up recently, they need a car also. What, what's CC? Uh, Community College of Beaver County. Okay. Yeah. So they the the uh, CCBC tests every Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. Um, before we go. Yeah. Okay. Um. You say you keep. Uh, how do they go about registering for GED? Do you, does Literacy Pittsburgh handle that, or do they have to go um, somewhere? They can. Uh, so um, if they want a scholarship, then they'll talk to Vince and get the scholarship application. They'll complete it for whatever subject or subjects they're asking for a scholarship for um, that they would have passed, met the minimum requirement uh, of the uh, passing practice test score. Um, and they would uh, then Vince or the student will email it to me and I, I would um, give uh, the student and, and Vince uh, 
I'll email them back uh, with the scholarship voucher or voucher codes. Um, and they would log into their G, the student would log into the GED.com exam. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, not exam, account, sorry. And then just click on the schedule test uh, button at the top once they uh, log into their account. And they just follow the, the, um, the steps. So it is important to note that um, schedule one test at a time when you're doing that, because if they select, if they passed all the exams and they want to schedule all the exams, if they uh, select all four at one time, it's going to try to put them all on the same day. It can't, um, <laughs> yeah. And so there might not be any test day options for them. Like there's nothing available. So just select, you know, schedule one exam at a time. Um, the only ones that I would say are okay to schedule back to back are science and social studies because they are the shorter exams. Um, they when put together, they add up to about the same time as the reading exam is. Um, so the RLA GED exam is um, two and a half hours. Um, the math is uh, two hours. The social studies is 70 minutes and the reading, sorry, the science is 95 minutes. Um, and those are the real GED exams. The GED practice test or GED ready exams, whatever you want to call them, are about half the time of the real exams. So the RLA practice test is um, 90 minutes. Uh, the RLA, sorry, the practice math test is 60 minutes. The practice social studies is 35 minutes and the practice science is 47 minutes. When you're talking about scholarship, that means the scholarship from Literacy Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, the scholarship uh, for us to, um, we call it scholarship application. It's, it's just the, um, an up, uh, uh, a couple papers they fill out, they answer some questions. Um, and uh, they let me know which subjects they want uh, vouchers for so we can pay for the exams. But they need to qualify um, um, by getting a 149 or higher on their practice test for whatever subject or subjects they're asking for a scholarship voucher code for. And they need to meet the minimum uh, class hours for the, um, the program year. So our program year starts every July 1st and ends June 30th. So they have to have a minimum of 12 instructional hours um, in that program year to uh, qualify for um, a scholarship. Um, and if, um, if they are asking for a full scholarship, like they took their, all their, they passed all their practice tests and they just wanna take their exams now, um, they have to at least schedule their post-test uh, for Literacy Pittsburgh, like the TAPE test with um, their coordinator or have that on, the coordinator needs to have that on the radar because historically, once students who, uh, when we were in person, students who get, got full scholarships would get the full scholarship and then go poof, <laughs> you know, and it's like, hello. So, um, and uh, so it's, um, it, it's good just to make sure that we get that post-test okay. if they, but that's only a requirement if they're asking for a full scholarship. Um, if they're asking just for one, one or two subject, scholarship vouchers, you know, they're still going to be continuing with us because they uh, have the other subjects to take. And I'd, I'd like to take a second, welcome the tutor who just joined us. Um, we, are, uh, we are recording uh, this, uh, this meeting. So if, uh, if you're okay with having your camera on, that's great, um, okay. but welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, no, I know. Any other questions about GEDs or GED readies? Uh, you had mentioned vouchers, and now I understand what you mean by the voucher. It's the voucher that they literacy issues. Yeah, so we purchase these codes from uh, GED testing services. We have GED ready vouchers for the practice tests, um, and we have GED scholarship vouchers, or we just say called GED vouchers for the real exams. Um, so um, uh, students um, to get a um, GED ready voucher to take the practice tests. Uh, they need to be um, uh, have a tape test score of a NRS three or higher, um, and and Vince would know uh, what their test level is. I don't know, Vince, do tutors know what their testing level is? The students uh, in general, yeah. Uh, and for anyone watching, if uh, if you've got if you know your student is interested in taking the GED and um, you've got questions about it, you can always ask your coordinator. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
Um, all right. Any, Sandra, do you have any questions about GEDs? No, I apologize for coming late. I, I um, no, I'm just really learning. I'm new to tutoring, um, and so I have an interest in a lot of what. Uh, sorry, expert <laughs> <laughs> does, um, and so I'm just learning, trying to take it all in. Sorry for that. Uh, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well then I guess I will move on then. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to be talking about foreign diplomas. So uh, for those uh, tutors who uh, teach our ELL students or we actually have a lot of our immigrant students who are in our GED classes also um, for various reasons, um, which we'll talk about in a second. <laughs> okay, so um, immigrants who have completed their high school or, or higher education, a lot. Of, uh, so we, we're seeing a lot more of our ELL students with university de degrees from their countries. Um, they can go through the process of evaluation to show U.S. equivalency. So uh, some of our students think that um, their education, they have to throw away their education when they move here. And that's not the case. So a lot of them choose to do the GED because they think that their education doesn't count. Um, and so sometimes even when they're an intake with us, they'll say they don't have anything. You know, some, that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen um, because they, they think it's, it's worthless and it's not. Um, if they have the proof. <laughs> so um, uh, to get um, evaluations done, um, they can go to any of the NACES agencies and that's the national, um, accre nationally accredited credential evaluation services. Um, there's about 15 agencies. Um, I do, do have their websites up, but I'm, I don't wanna do a lot of back and forth. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but this one does have the link to it in um, the, uh, in the PowerPoint, which, as I said um, earlier, I'll, I will share it with uh, Vince so he can post it along with the recording. So you guys can, well, can go and peruse these websites on your own as well. Um, so um, there's about 15 nationally accredited evaluation agencies in the United States um, that um, you know, are recognized. So, but the most, there's two uh, common ones that um, the schools in Allegheny County prefer. Um, and those are WES, which are a World Education Services, and um, ECE, which is Education Credential Evaluators. Uh, those are the two more popular ones. But um, if the student is wanting to go to school, if the person, I mean, not the person, if the reason why they want to get their evaluation done is to pursue higher education, um, it's always good to check with the school and the um, department of whatever they want to major in. So if they're going to a they want to go to grad school or they want to apply directly to a four-year university and major in um, psychology or computer science, they should go to the, um, the uh, Department of Psychology or Department of, or Compu of Computer Sciences admissions page uh, because sometimes they will specify a different NACES agency that they need to, um, to go through. Um, and um, I've never, I don't know if that means that they definitely won't take this one, but it's always good to follow their admissions cr uh, criteria because, um, you know, you're trying to get into their programs and you, you want to follow their instructions. <laughs> um, they, might, they might automatically say no <laughs> um, if you don't. Okay. So, um, I said that. Um, so for um, evaluations, they have to have their documents with them. So I usually use ECE because most of the time for most of the countries, they will take the um, official, un officially unofficial <laughs> uh, documents from the student directly. So as you know, official documents aren't really official if the student has touched them, right? Um, official documents are usually in a sealed envelope, stamped, signed, and all that stuff and sent from institution to institution. Um, but ECE will take the, the documents, the original documents from the student, as long as they are stamped and um, have the, um, all the other uh, signatures and stuff on it that do make them, um, that will usually make them official if they're in an envelope. Um, and they have to get those translated into English word for word. Um, so uh, that requires, I mean, whoops, some of the students actually have them translated already, or sometimes they're already in English. It's like if they're from India or, um, or if their education was in English, sometimes their transcripts are already, are already in English. 
um, but um, uh, most of the time they need to be translated. So I would help them with um, obtaining quotes, uh, the process of doing that, um, or they can just go to their consulate or sometimes they find places on their own that uh, will do um, accredited or not accredited, but um, certified notarized um, English translations um, through their own network. And that's fine. So ECE and um, sometimes WES, when they accept the documents from the student directly, they will mail the original documents back to the student with the evaluation report. Um, they will not keep the original documents. They'll keep a co the copies of the translations. So what is usually required when um, ECE does this is you, mail, you, know, you fill out your profile, you pay, you tell them what kind of uh, evaluation you need or require or want. And then you mail everything to them, the original documents, um, the copies of the translations and anything else that they required. Um, and then they'll mail the evaluation back and the original documents in the whatever language it was. And they keep the copies of the English translations. Um, ah. But sometimes it's impossible for students to do the evaluation. They, um, don't have, they only have a picture of it, um, or um, they uh, had to flee their country and their universities or schools were bombed. Um, in those instances, they can't get their stuff evaluated and they have no proof of their education. Um, and I mean, and that's what makes me so sad sometimes when, uh, that things like that happen when we, when we come across students within those situations. Um, so, when do immigrants need an education evaluation? They want to go to college or a trade school or uh, any higher education program. Um, so depending on the program um, that they want to apply to, so some students have a university degree and their high school diplomas with them. If they want to just start over, they want to, you know, like I want to change careers, I want to forget I, I did university in my country. Um, so they can just get their, high school diploma and transcripts evaluated. Um, for certain programs like medical programs, um, any medical program actually, they only require the high school diploma to be evaluated. They don't care about the university stuff. The state of Pennsylvania requires proof of high school equivalency, U.S. High school equivalency for any medical field that, needs, that requires certification. Um, so that is, those are the documents that those students will need whether they have them in Pittsburgh or they have um, a way of obtaining them from their country. If it's not possible, then they will need to take their GED. And some students choose to do that anyway, just because they don't want to go through the hassle, <laughs> you know, um, the cost and uh, time. I mean, not the time, but the cost and just the headache. Because um, some for some countries, it is a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Certain countries um, will only give it to the student directly and there's no way they can actually go you know, um, like Iraq is like that. Um, so if the student doesn't have it, they're kind of, um, they have to get their GED. Um, I just said that. Um, so some employers do require an evaluation um, of, their, um, of the degree, the university degree, to show you a sequency. Um, and that is employer specific. I know Duolingo is one of them. Um, they, and it might just be like funding or something like that that they get that some of their fund air this um, or um, uh, it make them it lets um, a certain part maybe um, to sh to show like all of our our employees are doing this or higher um, but um, if um, if a student isn't sure they can always um, get their degrees evaluated and put on their resume just to, to make them feel like they are more competitive. Um, and sometimes it does um, add a competitiveness to the resume. Uh, it gives the employer, it could give the employer a peace of mind knowing and the student peace of mind knowing that they do have the U.S. equivalent. Um, there are some countries like Cameroon um, where um, some of the education actually comes higher so I had a student one time that had a bachelor's degree. I can't remember in what sub in what field, but he came back to where he had a master U.S. master's degree. 
and he had only a bachelor's degree in his country. So I was like, wow, <laughs> that's some good schooling. So, um, but uh, um, these are the main instances for uh, getting a degree evaluated. Oh, are there any questions? No, okay. So as um, you can see, like if you're working with a student who's not from the United States and has their education from their country, um, if they think they have to get a GED because um, their education is not gonna be recognized, you can have a talk with your student. Like it's not required. Like um, some students will choose to still get their GED just to work on their English skills um, and their math skills, uh, make them more competitive. Or as I said before, they just um, don't want to go through the headache of evaluation. Okay, professional certifications in Pennsylvania. Ooh, this one is um, very interesting. I've learned so much with different working with different students, um, which is one of the things I love about my job. Um, keeps me on my toes, and I get to learn new things and along with the students. So. Um, so some professions do require state certification li or licenses to practice in the U.S. You know, a nurse, any medical field, nursing, doctors, lawyer, um, no, dentists, veterinarian, teachers. Um, I do have some engineers that wanted to go get their certifications, become a certified engineer um, uh, with, the, with the state boards. Um, so um, most of the time it's nurses and teachers, though. Those are the ones that I get the most. Um, so to get um, a certification in the state of Pennsylvania or in, in any state in the United States um, to be able to continue to work in the field of um, their education and experience, um, it always starts contacting the, the board of for whatever field that is to see uh, what steps need to be followed for um, like a better word, reciprocity. Um, and um, it always starts with an evaluation. So, um, some boards uh, require, they don't follow the NACES, um, like the nursing board, the state board of nursing, you have, they have to go through um, CGFNS, which is the certified graduates of foreign nursing schools or something like that. Um, and there's a whole lot of things. So a lot of the states have contracted with that agency um, because it's specific to the field. Um, but most other boards will, um, will let you choose um, West or EC or any of the NACES agencies, but it always starts with the evaluation. And some of them often have an English proficiency requirement so they might have to take the TOEFL or the IELTS or another type of um, English proficiency exam that the, the state board um, specifies. Um, so unfortunately, there are some uh, professions where there isn't a recipro foreign reciprocity. Um, lawyers are uh, <laughs> account um, sometimes accountants too, um, depending on the country. Um, dentists, they kind of do, uh, but for the most part, they have to go back to school. And same with veterinarians. Um, why veterinarians and dentists? I honestly don't know. I guess the procedures and the policies and, and rules, but um, they basically have to go back to medical school um, and, uh, and find uh, their own internship, um, not internship, residencies. Um, it's, um, it's very time consuming and costly. Um, and um, for some of our students who um, never um, get their fluency up to par, it's um, out of reach for quite a while. And so that's why many of our students in these fields choose to, like doctors also, doctors have to go back to school. Um, they used to just start over. Um, they have their degrees with them and everything like that, but they just choose to study nursing or study, um, become a medical assistant or something. Um, something that's still in the same industry, but um, a different career. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's really sad when that happens because it, it, it's a lot of um, wasted talent, you know? 
Um, and as you know, we're struggling for these kinds of professionals in our country too, and to have all these barriers uh, to prevent uh, foreign uh, professionals from actually practicing their craft, um, it's, it's, um, it's just, um, but that's what the, the rules are right now. Um, until these get changed, um, we have to follow these uh, rules and guidelines that the state and the federal uh, government has put in place for um, foreign educated professionals. So um, some of uh, professions are easier to attain a license. I did put doctor and veterinary because, um, oh, sorry, my thing went up, because they do have the option of going back to school. The ones that are the easiest to obtain are nursing and teaching. Um, why nursing and not doctors? It's um, <laughs> it really, but, um, nursing really only has to go through that CGFMS process of getting uh, all their licenses and education verified, but they do have to go all the way back to uh, primary school. <laughs> um, so it's like, whoo, yeah. Um, and uh, and then they just need to get their uh, background checks and, and um, if their in, in, uh, education was in English, they don't have to take the TOEFL. Um, and then they can send their NCLEX exam and, and then you know, pay for their, um, their license. Uh, teaching, it's um, just your stuff evaluated, then you send it to the board. The board will decide. They'll look over the classes that this, this, the teacher took, certain you know, pedagogy, child psychology, things like that. If they have that, which most countries do, they can sit for the, the certification exams. Um, and they have to take the toll if their uh, education was not in English. So that's a lot quicker and easier. But of course, as I said, if the um, student um, student's fluency level is there, um, it, can be a, it can be a long process because all these exams are timed. Um, and it can be very, very frustrating for the student. Sometimes um, I have had students uh, you know, go start the process, go through it and, and start studying and, and everything. And, and they just get frustrated and they decide to change careers because um, they, um, they can't, they're, they're fluent in, you know, their um, reading comprehension speed isn't fast enough and they time out of these exams. And so um, it's not that it's just they time out. Um, okay, so why do some immigrants decide to start over in a new or related career? They think it's not recognized, their experience in education not recognized. They don't have access to their educational documents. Like I said, um, their, um, their schools may have been bombed or some, some um, countries will refuse to mail things internationally. So you have to go to the person to pick things up. And that's not possible all the time. You know, many of our students are low income. They, they have families. Um, so they, they, it, they have to start over. The process of obtaining a certification in the previous profession is too long and expensive. And um, as I had mentioned before, some, stu some students just choose to start over because they want that extra English practice. And they, um, uh, whether or not they decide to change careers or not, some still get their GED and then go on to pursue the same career that they had, continue it. Um, but some do end up changing career paths. Um, and some just have a change of heart, like I hated my job, you know, I just wanna start over. You know, it's a brand new country, brand new life, let's start over. Um, and when I work with students, um, I try to give them all their choices and, and, but I make sure that, or their options, I should say, and, the decision is theirs, and whatever they decide, even if they change back and forth, um, I will help them along the way, or my volunteers will help them along the way, or I'll refer them to other places to um, to get the help in whatever career pathway that they ch so chose. Um, and, um, yeah, it is very um, eye opening <laughs> working with um, immigrant. Um, and particularly professionals from other countries. Um, and it lets you know how lucky we are 
and with our education and stuff, um, how it's recognized in a lot of different countries um, as opposed to, you know, our students. So are there any questions? I'm sorry if I brought everybody down. <laughs> no, it, uh, it's it was just very, uh, it's very uh, detailed. Like, um, I, I don't have any, personally, I don't have any questions because like all of the questions that I had before I came in, I kind of understand the process now. <laughs> okay, cool. Mm. I can't hear you, Mike. I'm sorry. What did you say? I feel the same way. Um, I, I do, uh, you know, I have questions coming in, but you pretty well with her or with uh, how you oh. presented it. So Wonderful. Awesome. Glad to hear that. What about you, Sandra? Um, I mean, you may have covered this or maybe it's not real relevant, but I was just curious to know how many um, students actually complete GEDs through the Literacy Pittsburgh process. It, like, it changes every year. Um, like this year, unfortunately, because of COVID mm -hmm. um, and things being delayed, um, um, the testing centers being closed and GED testing services um, taking a while to get things up and running. I, I think the, te the remote testing started in late August. Um, it, um, but even then, it's like students needed to take their practice tests and um, and then they weren't really comfortable uh, in the option. More started getting comfortable more, um, closer to like halfway into the, the program year, um, just because they realized, you know, I want to get this done and there's no testing centers that are really. Right. <laughs> so um, I'm going to do what I need to do. Um, uh, and, uh, for context, halfway into the program year is December ish. Yeah, November, okay. December. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, our program year starts July 1st and ends June 30th. Um, so, uh, and there's some students that um, have started taking some remotely, but um, didn't like it. And so they're uh, working on getting their, you know, still working on some of their subjects, um, uh, testing center. But um, so on average, um, it's probably a 40 to 50 uh, agency wide every year. Um, not as high as we'd like it, but um, we don't want our we don't want to force our students before they're ready mentally, um, like they, mentally and emotionally, I should say, uh, because even though um, we think they might be ready, um, if they don't feel ready, that's um, a thing. And sometimes we we uh, we will like if a student does have anxiety issues and they tell us, then we will try to help guide them through it and stuff like that. So I have had met, I have met um, about um, test anxiety issues because I suffered from that um, big time starting in high school and university. Um, so I know what it's like, like to know stuff, you know, to know that you know this stuff and you take the exam and you get there and it's like, yeah. you just blank out and, right. or you get nosebleeds or you start rubbing your, you know, it's, or you have to go to the use the restroom and you get like, oh my God. You know, it's, um, it, right. it, so it's like, I, I, I talk about strategies that worked for me and, and that, um, that uh, when I went to workshops and stuff I learned about. So, um, and it's, it, I'm not, it doesn't help all students, but it has helped some. Sure. Um, some it, students it just need to find their own strategies. Okay, if a student fails the GED, do they have to wait a certain time? You may have said this, and I apologize if you covered it. That's right. a good question, and I did forget to say that uh, mention that. So, um, it, so it depends on um, so the um, regardless of whether they take the exam remotely at home or at a testing center, they um, we would recommend that they look at their their GED score report to see what they need to work on, uh, because that's what I love about the GED ID test and the GED exam itself. They give a score report. And it tells you all the types of all the topics of the questions that you missed. It's like this is what you need to study to get a better score, and then you can um, link a um, study material to it, and then it tells you what pages those topics are on. It's like, oh, like lovely. You don't have to guess. And so, um, I see. so it just goes to this. Um, so we do recommend that our students look at that and study a little bit before they schedule their next exam. But. Um, uh, between the first exam attempt and the second exam attempt, they don't um, technically they don't have to wait, but we recommend that they do. Um, now, when the student is taking their exam remotely, 
they only get one exam a retake per subject. If they fail the first time, they only they can only have uh, one time to retake it, uh, regardless of whatever length it they can take they can take it the next week. Um, but as I said, we encourage them to study a little bit, you know, look at their score report. Um, if they fail it the second time, but then they have to wait 60 days to take it. But with the remote exam, in order to qualify to schedule it remotely, you have to pass the practice test within 60 days of, uh, of taking that exam. So if they fail it the second time, that means they have to retake the practice test to be able to, uh, because they have to wait 60 days, right? After the, right. Fail the second time. So they'll have to retake the practice test and pass it to be able to schedule it remotely again. Is that 60 days for uh, only for the uh, online test? Yes, the remote online test at home. Now, um, if a student takes um, a, um, their test at a testing center in person, so um, as I had told Mike earlier, you don't have to take a pass practice test to take the uh, to schedule an exam at a testing center. Someone can just go and schedule their exams and take them. If they pass, great, yay. Um, but uh, they don't have that 60 day practice test requirement, you know. Um, so if it uh, takes a test at a testing center, they fail it the first time, they can schedule another time. They fail the second time, they have a third time they can take it. If they fail the third time at a testing center, then they do need to wait 60 days. They're going to say, dude, <laughs> you know, look at your score report, see what you need to study and study, man. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then reschedule. <laughs> okay. um, so at a, a testing center, um, the second and third attempts are $10. Okay. And per then test, um, right. per test, per test. Yeah. The original fee is $30 per subject. So they fail the $30 first attempt. Second attempt is $10. Third attempt, ten dollars per subject. Um, then they wait sixty days, and then it it kind of loops back to the first attempt, thirty dollars. Remotely, they do not get this discount, discounted retake. Mm -hmm. Okay, probably because they have to pay for the proctor um, and the and all that because it, it is being recorded, and uh, so a proctor, you know. Um, well, them and, and staring at them and listening to them. So it's yeah, staff. So I'm, I'm assuming that's probably why that one is not discounted for the retake. Probably. Okay, so it's a thirty dollars, thirty dollars. Wait sixty days, thirty dollars. Okay. Um, so um, what was I going to say? Oh, it, it's also important to know that for the remote exam, um, I had mentioned this to Mike. Uh, they do have to do a system test on their computer and internet connection. Chromebooks do not pass this. Um, I don't know why, um, probably, I mean, it, it probably has to do something with the down, they have to download the Envy software and it just isn't compatible. Um, but um, if the student um, has access to another laptop, um, like uh, their uh, spouses or a friend's laptop or a family members at another house, they can make arrangements to, um, um, to use that, but they do need to do the system test on laptop too to make sure it's compatible and they can download the on software and i would do the system test and um on that computer in the environment that they're going to be taking the test so if they're going to be taking it at whoever's house that the laptop is and do the system test there but if they're going to borrow it and take it home they do the system test at their home because it's also testing the internet connection um so i, I have had students who have borrowed laptops uh, from their family or friends to do that um, I mean, as a matter of fact, we have tech lending at Literacy Pittsburgh. So mm -hmm. if if a student um, if a student needs to um, take their GED and they specifically want to pursue the uh, online one instead of going to a testing center, we can usually we can provide a laptop for that. Yeah, I mean, we usually give Chromebooks, but we also have other laptops that we can make arrangements with. So um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Vince. So if um, some students have uh, made arrangements with their program coordinator to meet them um, office, um, if the coordinator is able to get into their office um, or one of the offices, you know, one of the Literacy Pittsburgh offices, um, ex exam there. So um, at, in that instance, the coordinator will 
do the system test um, and download the OnView software for the student. Uh, and, um, and then the student will just schedule their exam after they email their um, government issued ID and proof of uh, Pennsylvania residency to the state to uh, lift the alert. Um, you had uh, uh, missed this, but every student um, in their GED.com account has an alert um, that um, if they went to take their exams remotely, in order to lift that alert, they email their government oh, I, issued unexpired government issued ID and proof of Pennsylvania residency. For yes, for sir. all of the for all the details on the GED, um, I mean, this is all being recorded, so I'll be sending yeah. out the the YouTube link okay, tomorrow, yeah, yeah. so you can catch up yeah. on all of that. Yeah, that's uh, true. From the beginning. Um, yep. But I, I did forget to mention that um, for the remote GED exams, you can only schedule one at a time. Um, so even though they passed all, they made, passed all the practice tests, they can only schedule one exam. And then once they pass or take that exam, whether or not they pass or fail, then after they take the exam, then they can schedule the next exam. Whereas at a testing center, you can schedule all four exams um, on different days, you know, um, you know, like say I want to schedule for my exam day, um, day, schedule my math for tomorrow, I schedule my reading for next Monday, I schedule, you know, my, I could do that if I'm taking it at a testing center. Mostly, you can only schedule one exam at a time. What are the subjects for GED? You, you keep saying. Um, yeah, yeah, so I say RLA, RLA just for it's reasoning through language arts. So that includes the reading comprehension uh, and grammar, which are the multiple choice written A. Um, the reading exam, uh, so students um, sometimes get confused. So the practice test for the reading, the RLA is um, only two parts. They combine part one, the reading comprehension grammar in the multiple choice, and then part two is the essay. But the real exam, three parts. And the, it's the reading uh, comprehension multiple choice, part one, part two is the written essay. Then they get a 10 minute break. And then part three is the multiple choice grammar. So um, I'm, I had a student who took a, a, it at a testing center, walked out at, after it, oh, she thought she was done when it was her break. And the testing center was like, wait, come back. And they're like, thank you. You know, and, was like, and so she didn't pass because she did not take the part. Uh, she's like, so, I felt so terrible. That's all one subject. RLA that's is all one, one subject. subject. RLA is one exam. And that's the two hour exam. Then you have the mathematics, which is a two hour exam. Uh, you have the science, which is uh, about an hour and a half. Then you have the social studies, which is just over one hour. Yep, so those are the four. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, any, any other questions? Awesome. Well, uh, thank you, uh, both of you, for joining us. And, and thank you, Andrea, for, um, for sharing all of that. You're very, very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, have a good night, everyone. I'll, uh, I'll send out um, the recording of this meeting and also the, um, uh, the PowerPoint uh, from earlier. Yeah, and um, on the last page of the PowerPoint, which I didn't uh, show, it has my contact information. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you ever have any questions about uh, diplomas, verifications, evaluations, mm -hmm. GED, any of that, you can ask Andrea Lynch. directly. You can ask your coordinator. There's lots of people who can get you to the right place. Okay. All Thank right. you very much. Have a good night. Take care. Thank you. you guys have a great night. You too. Bye. Thanks.